eyes on her and I guess the only question really once this race gets underway is will any of them try to go with Paula and of course the pacemakers we'll talk more about the pacemaking situation once they get underway just uh, going down the line there alongside Paula Radcliffe 104 is Susan Chepkamai 102 wearing the hat and the gloves is Catherine Endereva who held the world record before Paula took it away from her on the other side 106 is Dirazu Tulu and they probably her main rivals as we go further down the line. And Brendan, we shouldn't underestimate the strength of the field here. This is a fantastic collection of athletes, world-class athletes in every sense. And obviously our eyes are focused on number 101, Paula Radcliffe, but next to her, getting ready to time herself, the great Dorado Tulu, twice Olympic champion. She's beaten Paula on many occasions. And today Paula is very conscious that the little Ethiopian is coming back into form. Two hours and how many minutes ahead? The world record, two hours, 17 minutes and 18 seconds as John Disley and Shirley Brasher prepare to send them on their way. The last few moments when the nerves really start to kick in. 26 and a quarter miles ahead of them. Away they go then, the Flora London Marathon 2003, the women's elite field. With a sprinkling of men involved, a mixed race officially to enable pacemakers to hopefully take these athletes, in particular Paula Radcliffe, to, well, who knows, perhaps a world record, certainly a very, very fast time. Conditions today, pretty much ideal. A little bit warmer indeed than last year, despite the fact that a few of the athletes wearing gloves, including Paula. No hat this time, of course. Remember in Chicago, she wore that nice little blue bubble hat. Catherine Endereva decided to uh, take on the same dress today, but Paula in the shades, in the gloves, the long socks, and already looking to see where the pacemakers are. And there are eight of them, incidentally. We'll talk more about that in a second, but they're in groups of two and they've been asked or two of them have been asked to go off at 216 pace two of them at 218 pace and two of them at 220 and another two just to hang around to see what else happens well if you think about it it's less than 20 years ago when the women's marathon arrived on the olympic scene in los angeles and that by the great joan benoit and if you just think 20 years later and here we are now paula radcliffe holding the world best time two hours and 17 minutes what an advancement the women have made in distance running. And there she's surrounded, which just is a testament to the ability of this woman, that they need male pacemakers to help her run quick. They're good athletes in themselves, in their own right, these Kenyan pacemakers. And on the back of their vest, they've got the, the time that they're aiming at, and already Paula Radcliffe holding on to the pacemakers, and she's decided she's gonna go with it. So Paula Radcliffe doing what she said she was gonna do, Run with the pacemakers at around 2 hours 16 pace. Obviously, we'll keep you posted on how that progresses, but Paula Radcliffe chasing the four male pacemakers ahead of her in the red vest, number 101, the familiar sight of Britain's top distance runner, the woman who's holding her own even with the men. And interestingly enough, today, there's the time on the back. Let's just see what it says. 2 hours 16 minutes, well... I wonder if Paula's telling us something already. The world record, two hours, 17 minutes, and Paula Radcliffe getting on terms with these men. And I think it's good that she's able to do this. I think it's good that she's allowed to adopt the male pacemakers. And there they are, too, settling down, Paula Radcliffe. Two hours, 16 minutes, her target, and the race already splitting up. Pacemakers going at the various paces, and the athletes following in their wake on their own schedules. Well, as Brendan said, they're already starting to split up. Just to, we saw a shot from the back, but we'll see most of them from the front. The two pacemakers running at 2.16 pace are wearing 120 and 123. 123 is Christopher Candy, and Samson Loy Wapet is wearing 120. Oh, there they are. And already just starting to drift away from the 
To be honest, in the early stages, Brendan, there's not much difference between 216 and 218 pace, so these pacemakers are being asked to uh, have almost perfect judgment, which uh, it makes it a bit difficult choice for one or two of the athletes behind. The likes of Endereba, if we remember in Chicago, there was a pretty good pace set early on, and Endereba stayed with Paula right through the early stages, but it seems as though today they've decided to sit back a little bit and just wait and see what happens and follow the other two pacemakers who are running. A 218 pace. 104 on the far side of your picture there, Susan Chep Kamai, there she is, 107 closest to the cam cameras. Adriana Fernandez from Mexico. There's Dorato Tulu, former winner of the London Marathon, of course. Olympic champion on the track, but no stranger to the marathon. Now these are the two guys who are running at two. 18 pace, 121 and 122. Ibrahim Mitai is 121 and Mark Yatic 122. And it just seems as though, certainly for Tulu, one or two of the others, they may be electing to even stick with the 220 guys. And it is important, isn't it, Brendan? We, it, it, these are very, very experienced athletes, but even for them, slight misjudgment in the early stages can really cause them problems later on. And it's important that they have a race plan that they stick to no matter what Paula Radcliffe decides to do. Well, I think they've already decided. They decided in the week leading up to it that if Paula wants to run at 2.16 pace, she can do that. It's up to her. There she is, following the two pacemakers, and there we look at the chasing group, which contains all the talent. Gerardo Tulu, Susan Chepkamai, Adriana Fernandez, they're all in that group, and the pacemakers, Yatic and Mitej of Kenya, and they're doing the job for there. They've gone through the first mile, the opening mile, in the women's marathon, five minutes and ten seconds. Completely downhill at the start. They're running from Greenwich Park down towards the river. So the first couple of miles in the marathon are generally downhill, but that's a good opening, five minutes and ten seconds. Already, if you were working it out, and I wouldn't be so keen to work it out just yet, but that is faster than the pace that Paula Radcliffe ran when she ran in Chicago. It's faster than she ran last year and it is a world record schedule, and she knows exactly that. She says she's running better than she's run before. She's had the real confidence from last year, and there she is, Paula Radcliffe. Well, here at the start of the mini-marathon, the two official starters to Stephen Redgrave and Todd Carty. Uh, Mark from East Enders or Tucker Jenkins, depends how old you are. Uh, Todd, uh, what brings you here to do this? Well, I mean, I'm a father of two, so um, it's you know, nice to see the kids get up bright and early on a s Sunday morning and uh, do their thing. And have you run a marathon yourself? I haven't, no. I d you wouldn't <laughs> want to see it. It's a not a very pretty sight. Well, this is a man who has. Steve, you've run it before, but... Uh not this year. Yeah, it's, uh, unfortunately, the big grin across my face. I can't do it this year because of my broken collarbone. But uh, now my wife's out there running this. this, this well, she'll be starting very shortly. But uh, now looking forward to today. OK, well, looking forward to starting this race. So off you go, up to the podium. Get ready and start the race. Well, I know this will be a relief to millions of you at home because Lucy Benjamin, alias Lisa Fowler, is safe and well I'm in London. Alive. <laughs> I am alive. <laughs> Where are you only training in Portugal? What, what's that? What, sorry? Are you only training in Portugal? Oh, yes, that's all I was doing in Portugal. <laughs> Absolutely. Just training for the London Marathon, yeah. <laughs> On the serious side of it, though, this is your first marathon. How are the nerves at this point? Um, I'm excited. I, I mean, I, I am scared, obviously, but I'm, I'm more excited than anything else. I'm, I've, I've been training now for two and a half months, and it's good to kind of get it all to c coming to a head. So today's the day, and I'm just going to go for it. Have the cast of EastEnders been sponsoring you for this one? Uh, yeah, a few. Yeah, absolutely, and they've all been really wishing me well and everything, so I know they're all thinking of me. And how much money are you hoping to raise and for whom? As a team, um, I'm, I'm heading Team Flora, and uh, as a team, and uh, there's 40 doctors um, in my team, we're hoping to raise over £150,000 for the British Heart Foundation. Fantastic effort. Now, the big question is, when will you be coming back to Albert Square, or will you? Aha! I really couldn't tell you. I, to be honest, I don't know. As far as I know, that's it now. That's the last you've seen of Lisa. So, um, But, I mean, she is alive, so you never know. No. Well, it's not the last we're going to see of Lucy today. Good luck That's to you. Not. Thank you very much. I need it. <laughs> and so the Adidas Mini London Marathon starts off with the wheelchair athletes. 2.65 miles. They're starting at the junction of Southwark Bridge at Upper Thames Street. And, of course, they finish, as everybody else does today, in the Mall. Quite a few competitors there, and we'll keep you in touch with what's going on in the, uh, the course of the... 
Well, this will be a familiar sight over the next couple of hours and a sight I hope that uh, you won't be too disappointed to see. I know many people who maybe aren't so familiar with athletics have enjoyed watching the exploits of Paula Radcliffe over the last couple of years in particular. And she is going to be out on her own as far as the women's race is concerned. She's going to get help from the pacemakers for, we hope, quite a long way. But it will really be about Paula and the clock. She's set her stall out right from the start here. She's sometimes a little bit coy, Paula, isn't she, about how fast she's going to go? But uh, she's going very quickly already. Well, there's the chasing group already at this stage. They're nine minutes into the race. And there, the gap, you can see Paula Radcliffe following her two pacemakers and then the gap behind. That following group there, I think, is quite interesting already at this stage. If you look closely into that group, looking for Catherine and Dereba, number 102. She's the second fastest woman in history behind Paula Radcliffe. And just a, just a, a quick glance at that chasing group, she's taking up an interesting position, Catherine and Dereba. She's actually off the back of the chasing group, which I think is a bit of a surprise. She came to London, she was very disappointed to hear about the tactics that were going to be adopted by the pacemakers. She was expecting to be in a women's only race. And there you can see the gap. Paula Radcliffe leads. Then the two male pacemakers at the end, at the front of the chasing group. And then right at the back of that chasing group, in the red vest, surprising to me, there's Catherine and Dereba, the second fastest woman runner of all time. And she's taking up a surprisingly low casual opening. She's allowing some class athletes ahead of her. And the athletes ahead of her include Dorado Tulu, the Olympic champion. But that's an interesting move by Catherine and Dereva, just to lay off the pace. Fernandez, uh, number 107. Chef Kamai, number 104. Number 105, Const Constantina Dita. And there's the leader, Paula Radcliffe, through two miles in 10 minutes and 18 seconds. Well, that's very fast pace. Very, very fast pace indeed. Inside uh, world record pace by quite a way from Paula Radcliffe. And these pace pacemakers doing a good job. And there's been a lot of discussion about these pacemakers. Let's hear what Paula Radcliffe herself thinks about it. The way I understand it now, I think, is that we have men racing the race who are going to finish the race. And it's just going to be like a, a smaller scale mixed race. Um, I think originally, when I, I read in the press over Christmas that they were considering if I requested it, making it a mixed race. So then I thought about it and thought, well, well why not? Because that's easier than having pacemakers, women, whether they're women pacemakers or male pacemakers. It's far easier to have a mixed race because you don't have to say beforehand what pace you want to go through in. You can just race them. Um, and so I thought, well, that's easier. Not but for all the other women, for Dina Drossin, who's going to be trying to break the American record and is running really well, um, for other British athletes who are trying to make the qualifying time for championships, the whole way down the field to run in a mixed race would help everybody. So I thought, well, OK, if everyone's happy with that, we'll, we'll go with that. And then it came back, well, no, we're going to put these male pacemakers in. And at that stage, it was all out of my control. Um, and it was between the marathon organisers and the IAAF, what was happening. And, I was a little bit upset that I was being portrayed as somebody coming in demanding all these things, which I wasn't. I was happy to run with women's only race, mixed race, whatever. It's a race to me, and the most important thing is to, to race the other women and, and to, to run as well as possible. Um, so I just kind of just let it go over my head then um, and just concentrated on, on getting here in the best shape and um, being in the best shape to run the race as well as I can positive thing though is if it does go to plan and there is a world best it will of course be ratified therefore. Yes and that's definitely there would never have been a question I think of that not happening because had they said it wasn't going to be ratified I would have said well I don't want to run then I want to run on my own. Probably. Well, I think she would have run on her own, whatever happened, but she does have these pacemakers who are doing a sterling job. Very quick through the first two miles, way inside world record pace. She's already 14.3 seconds ahead of the chasing group and heading at the moment, if she were to maintain this, it's something around 2.15. But let's just remember that these first two, three miles are very quick anyway. Well, back at Blackheath. The wheelchair race is getting ready. Tanny Gray Thompson can be seen right in the center of that start. As far as the men's race is concerned, four former champions, including the defending champion David Weir, and Tanny Gray Thompson going for her seventh victory. I'll just have a look across at some of the competitors. Those numbers on the front of the chairs there are designed by 
King's School in Tynemouth, up in Tynemweir. And I've got Ian Thompson, Tanny's husband, sitting next to me. What about uh, Tanny's form at the moment? Tanny's been training pretty hard over the last winter. I think last year was very much a transition period because, again, having a baby, then coming straight back into the London Marathon and then into the World Championships. Last year was very much a year for people to try and beat Tanny, and one or two people did. But this year, she's hoping for a lot more successful year, and she's been training hard over the winter and looking forward to London. Well, also in the women's field, we've got Debbie Brennan, Paralympic champion on the track. Uh, she's... Uh apparently got hold of a new racing chair just over the last couple of days and a few raised eyebrows when uh, I think she's gone into this race and she's just actually behind Tanny there wearing the dark spectacles and the black and white vest of Birchfield Harriers it could be taking a bit of a risk if she's got a new chair um, hopefully she's uh, again balanced all these risks out and um, shouldn't see any problems during the race but 26 miles is, is quite a long way to be going on a new chair as far as the men are concerned, I mentioned David Weir. Dave Holding, former winner and Paralympic champion himself, missed London Marathon in 2001 and 2002 because of tennis elbow. And what about this comeback? Uh, David, I think, is out here to just enjoy himself. He's been training um, hard, really, for the sprints over the last few years. Um, but part of the London Marathon is that, again, it's a good point during the year um, as a base for your, uh, your speed work during the summer. So he's hoping to just enjoy himself and see how well he gets on with it. And a quick word on the conditions. It's a perfect day. I'm actually hoping we can go for a course record here. Lovely sunshine, nice and warm. As Shirley Brasher and John Disley get this race underway. And as you say, absolutely perfect in terms of conditions. Perhaps a bit of a, a wind, especially in this early stage. And Tanny, around about halfway down that field. Interesting competitor I haven't mentioned is Tushar Patel. He'll be wearing number seven. He's a winner of the past, uh, the, the last two great Norms, and uh, certainly somebody who could challenge for a place in the top three. Yeah, I think between David Weir and uh, Tusha Patel, we've got a very strong British challenge there. But leading the group there is, uh, as you know, from France, who's very much the class in the place. But London Marathon does tend to be a leveller, so we hope for a British win here. Well, the course record is 1 hour 35.18, and Joel Genot, who you've just mentioned in, he's got a lifetime best of 1.23. And having said that, as David Holding just goes through the picture in the red and white of England, uh, London is not known as a super-fast course, is it? No, there's quite a lot of twists and turns, and the cobbles don't help. Um, it's, the pace for, it's the kind of race where you want a hard man. It's very much a hard man's race. And if David Weir and Tusha Patel can get in with Joel Genot in the early paces, then... Hopefully they'll be there at the end and be all chance sprinting. Well, joined from the world of football is uh, Mark Hughes, and this is your first time as a marathon runner, is it? Yeah, it is. Um, uh, I'm looking forward to it. It's a great atmosphere out here, so uh, everybody's told me about the atmosphere and, and said to enjoy it, so that's what I'm planning on doing, if that's possible. I was going to say, is it possible to enjoy running 20, over 26 miles? Well, it's unknown territory for me. I I've, uh, obviously haven't uh, run the distance yet, so uh, we'll see how we go. Um, keep on telling me about the 18-mile point, so I've got to get past <laughs> that, so uh, uh, hopefully I'll be OK. And what about, how are you going to deal with that? Because have, have you put in the training, are you confident that uh, you can get there? Well, you never know, but um, I, I, I hope I've done enough. But um, I think uh, initially when I started, obviously I had uh, big ideas of getting a good time, but uh, I've, uh, I've tempered that and now I'm just looking to get round. So uh, uh, I'm hopeful of doing that. You know, speaking as an ex-athlete and having talked to a lot of them, a lot of people are very happy to just, you know, put their feet up and, and do nothing. I mean, how are all the, the joints? Are they uh, still in full working order? Um, I'm not too bad, actually. I'm, I'm fortunate enough in my career. I didn't get any injuries. I didn't have any operations and, and ankles. But uh, I suppose if they were going to collapse on me, today's going to be the day. So uh, <laughs> keep your fingers crossed for me. And who are you running for today? I'm running for the Noah's Ark Appeal. It's, uh, it's a Welsh charity and uh, they're trying to raise funds for, for the, the building of a, a children's hospital in Wales. So uh, uh, hopefully we'll, we'll do well for that. And can't let you go without saying you know, congratulations on everything that you've achieved with Wales and uh, the European Championships. Something so much to look forward to. Yeah, we've had a good year and uh, had a good start, so we, we hope to capitalise on it. Yeah, but come on, you know, 12 points, 10, what's it, 10, 10 one in goals, is it? It's something like that, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's obviously better than we, we could have hoped for at the, at the stage we're at now, but uh, uh, we've done the easy part, the hard part's to come, so uh, um, long way to go, yeah. yeah I think it's like a long, <laughs> yes, I was going to say it's a long way, to, I'm sure you'll get plenty of support on the way round, good luck. OK, thanks. Thanks, Mark. OK, sir. Great. Well, the first finishers in the Mall. The Mini Wheelchair Marathon, Mark Rostron.
think it is. Former second placer in this race from North Gosforth, Newcastle upon Tyne. He won it in 2001, second last year. And uh, Brian Aldis, we think it is, who's second. Good time as well, just outside 11 minutes. So very competitive there. The first winners down the mile in the 2003 London Marathon. Mark Roston. I've got a veritable racing syndicate here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, from we're, from where? Step, uh, we're from, uh, well, Reading Rope Runners is the club, but we're all based around sort of Wokingham mm. early, yeah. uh, Reading. low early, Reading. Walking. Well, whose brainchild was this to do this? <laughs> well, we yeah, sort of yeah. fell into it. We've got some... <laughs> This is, yep. this is my fifth marathon, and my London fourth, marathon. And it's my fourth as so well. So you're veterans, in other words. Yeah, well, yeah. 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 it's our first run. Our yeah. first run. So we don't know what sort of advice have you been getting from the vets? Oh, loads, then? loads. Yeah. Don't go too fast to start with. I think that's what we're going to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And been training where together. will the bulk of the money that you raise today go to? Well, we're all running for different charities. Mine's to uh, children with, with leukaemia. Get kids going. The Anthony Nolan Bone Marrow Trust. UNICEF. And leukaemia research. Wonderful. A lot of people will benefit from your efforts today, ladies. You go for it. Thank you. Well Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, while the atmosphere is building at the start, Paul Radcliffe already well on her way. And just look at those statistics there. 5.10, 5.8, and she's just run 4 minutes and 57 seconds for a third mile, which, as far as I know, Brendan, that might rank as one of the quickest miles ever run by a woman in a marathon. It would have to. I don't think any woman's ever run under five minutes in a, in a serious marathon like that before. Three miles and 15.15. 15. That's almost a minute faster after three miles than she ran last year when she set a world best time. I hope she's not getting too carried away. She's clearly extremely fit. She's clearly ready for this event. Her confidence is sky high. She's performing as though this is just a time trial. She's got pacemakers to help her. She's ignored the competition. She's ignored world-class athletes behind her, but she's been doing that almost for a year and it's been paying off. We're all extremely confident about Paula. She is getting to understand the marathon, having run two of the three fastest times of all time. But there is the following group. There's the second group. The pacemakers leading that second group. And Constantina Dieter, number 105, is leading that chasing group. She's, she'll, they're a long way behind Paula Radcliffe. There's Susan Chepkamai, number 104. She's the fastest half marathon runner the world's ever seen. And they're just behind her, not surprisingly, tailing off even that second group. A former winner of this event, Adriana F Fernandez, won the New York Marathon a couple of years ago. But those three are well behind Paula Radcliffe. And then there's another group of talented female athletes who are even down the road from that chasing group. So there we're looking at Paula Radcliffe running into new territory, running faster than she ran in Chicago, running faster by a minute than she ran here this time last year. Paula Radcliffe looks to be in fantastic form, in fantastic condition, looks very, very balanced but she is challenging the barriers these days, and let's face it, she's been challenging them successfully for a year now. Well, we, we're saying that it's Paula pushing the pace. We have to bear in mind, Brendan, that there are two guys ahead of her who were told to run at 2.16 pace. They're running much faster than that at the moment. And I know that uh, Tim Hutchings, who looks after the elite field, was telling me yesterday that he told the pacemakers to watch and listen, and if Paula says anything, if she says go faster, if she says go slower, to take heed and to make sure that the fully aware of where she is and what she wants. So either she's telling them to keep running at this pace or she's happy enough to let them run this fast. She's just run five minutes and seven seconds for the fourth mile, 20 minutes and 22. So maintaining that very, very quick pace. And this is much quicker than not only that she ran here last year, but the pace she set in Chicago as well over the first few miles. Now, London is much quicker through the first five or six miles as you head down towards Cutty Sark. But even so, this is very, very brave of Paula Radcliffe. She's always brave. She always likes to go out hard. But even by her standards, it's almost frightening how fast she's going. And, well, as Brendan said, let's hope that she's judging it right. Remember when we sat here last year, Brendan, her first ever marathon, and we were questioning how fast she was running, whether it was wise, and she just kept getting quicker and quicker as the race went on. Maybe today. Well, the one thing you'll know about Paula is, as Brendan said, she will have prepared in her own mind exactly to the sort of time she thinks she can do. She has no barriers in her head, I don't think, about how fast she can run. And to 
today is an opportunity for her to make a real statement about that Olympic marathon next year and may well want to frighten everybody away. Well, behind Paula Radcliffe, this is the third group, and in that third group is the second fastest woman of all time, number 102, Catherine Undereva in the black hat and the red vest. Right behind her, number 103, Ludmilla Fetrova. And I'm just looking at this group, I wonder if... I wonder if Dorado Tulu's there. There she is, Alemu, number 108, the Ethiopian sixth placer in the Olympic Games. And just next to Alemu is Dorado Tulu, the twice Olympic 10,000 meter champion. And also, just next to Alemu, it looks to me like Dina Drossen, of the United States, number 113. So look at that group on its own. That's a real talented distance running squad. The Kenyan placemakers happy to wave to the crowds, doing the job for these talented female athletes, these great female athletes. And they are minutes, over, well over a minute behind Paula Radcliffe, who's running into new territory in this women's marathon. There's Paula, literally through four miles. Interestingly no, now, we're looking to see the five mile point. The five mile point is extremely relevant in the marathon. The first five miles of the London Marathon, if anything, are very comfortable, but she's making it different. She's changing the rules. And at the moment, when you get an athlete who's as good as she is and as talented as she is and as in ready as she is, then challenging the rules is what distance running is all about, pushing back the frontiers. And I'm just thinking about Paula. This may be her chance to run one of the great races of all time because she won't run another marathon till Athens next summer, and that won't be a, an opportunity for her to run quick. It may be the opportunity to win the coveted Olympic gold medal and then it'll be two years from now before we see Paula in a position to run a fast marathon. So maybe she's doing what all runners should do and seizing the opportunity. When you're ready, when you're fit, and when things have gone well, you have to take your chances. And this is a great chance for Paula Radcliffe. That looks like the five mile point, 25 minutes and around 30, 25, 33, another five minute and 10 mile. And overall, if you look at the time, that 5.10 for, for the miles, brings you home in two minutes, two hours and 15 minutes. So Paula Radcliffe really is pushing back the frontiers here. Well, a big lead already for Paula Radcliffe. A long way to go, but these athletes here, as Brendan was said, world-class athletes, they're running fast time, but they're not in the same league as Paula Radcliffe at the moment. Well, an 11 to 12 row boys, John Ferguson has had a very busy few days, haven't you, John? Yeah. So what have you been doing? On Friday, uh, I was at a family wedding up in Skye, and the coach was leaving Scotland on Saturday morning, so I couldn't get back to the mainland in time. So I drove down to Inverness and got a flight from Inverness to London Luton, and then I had to catch three separate trains to arrive at Egham Station and then I got the, the taxi to the hotel we were staying in and met up with the team. Wow, what a long journey, but you, you must be looking forward to the race after that journey, eh? Yeah. Okay, have a great time. All right, thanks. Okay. Well done. Yeah. Well, joining me now is uh, the Prime Minister's right-hand man, Alistair Campbell. Uh, are you sure this is a good idea, running a marathon? Uh, no, <laughs> I'm not entirely convinced. I woke up this morning feeling pretty nervous, to be honest. I've got to say, how has the training uh, gone? Because it's been quite a busy time, obviously, at the moment. Yeah, I've just, for some months now, I've run to work virtually every day, and that is my sort of staple diet for mileage. And long run a week and I've been doing that for months I've only missed one so I've pretty much done the training I wanted to do even though as you say it's been pretty busy so have you started the training purely <coughs> for this or have you always been a keen runner no I only started running about two and a half years ago I, I was a complete couch potato and armchair fan of all sports up to then and my son who's actually running in the mini marathon today he got me into running and uh, I got hooked pretty quickly and then last year about a year ago I decided I'd have a go and, and here I am and tell us the reason why you're running, because I know it's a, it's a cause very close to your heart. Well, my best mate, John Merritt, who was a journalist with me on The Mirror, uh, and he then uh, worked at The Observer as well, he died of leukaemia about 10 years ago, and then his daughter, Ellie, she died a few years later. His mother had already died of the same disease, so it's something that uh, this obviously had a pretty profound effect on me and on our family, and we've, you know, always kept close with his family. And when I decided to do it, and then I realised I could make a bit of money, uh, it was the obvious one to go for, and touch wood, we'll be up to about 300,000 by the end of it. Wow, that's amazing. Has, uh, has uh, Tony 
donated? Tony uh, has donated, yeah, <laughs> and so is the President of the United States, and really? so lots of others, yeah. So we've uh, no, and the, I mean it's been fantastic. I've never done anything like this before. I've never been involved in fundraising, and you literally do get the you know the massive donations from uh, from people with a lot of money and the sort of fivers and the tenors that come in from the, the little old ladies with spidery handwriting. So when you hit that wall at, say, 18 miles, that's going to be the motivation to carry on, is it? Well, one of the best pieces of advice I had, a, a guy I used to work with at the Mirror who's done marathons, and he wrote and said, imagine all the people who want you to do well on your right shoulder and the people who want you to do badly on your left shoulder and just get, keep pushing on and you'll find the weight of the right shoulder is, <laughs> is heavier than the weight of the left. So I've got that in mind. And are you ready for maybe a few comments along the way from the, from the crowd? I suspect so, but, you know, I think it's... Uh, I mean, even here you can feel it's a fantastic event and a great atmosphere. And it's actually, I, I came here, uh, to when the Prime Minister was presenting the prizes a few years ago and also my son's run the mini marathon. I mean, I've been to the marathon. It's really why I wanted to do it because I've, I've experienced the atmosphere and I just think it to be, to be part of the race as well. Well, we'll be following you as well. And I know Brendan's told our reporters to keep an eye out for you. Brendan has told your reporters to leave me alone because <laughs> Brendan is a good bloke and he doesn't like being messed about. He doesn't like his mates getting messed about by people of the BBC. That's not the Brendan I know. Anyway, good luck. Wish Thanks, you well. Thank you. Thanks. I've got Sally and Gina here with me. Sally, this is your second marathon. Clearly an old hand at it by now. Uh, well, no, not exactly, but... <laughs> Who are you running for today? It's Women Aid International. And how much are you hoping to raise? Uh, about £1,000. Fantastic effort. Now, Sally, it's your second. Gina, how many? It's about 150 for me. <laughs> I belong to the 100th Marathon Club. There is actually a club for people that have run over 100 marathons. And how many years ago did you start running? My first one was London 83, so 20 years today. <laughs> today. And of course, this is not just a special day in a marathon sense, is it? No, it's a day. <laughs> Happy birthday. I Thank hope you that it brings you all that you hope for. And what are so you hoping I. for today? Just under four hours, hopefully. Are you raising money as well, Gina? Yeah, for breast cancer, yes. We wish you all the best with it, the two of you. Opposite ends of the marathon spectrum in terms of experience, but it's all a big race, it's all a big challenge for the two of you. Go for it today. Thanks very Thank much. You. Thanks. Bye. Thanks. Bye, -bye. <laughs> well, good luck to them, four hours. Well, in that time, Paula will already be in a cold bath, I would imagine. She may well need it. She keeps this hot pace going. Look at that, 5.10 for the fifth mile, 25.32, maintaining this world record pace, Paula Radcliffe. Miles ahead of the rest of the field already. There's a six miles she's just gone through. Now that's the slowest one. Now that's interesting, isn't it? 522. As they head down towards Cutty Socket. It is a bit flatter here. She's not running downhill anymore. 3054 through six miles. That is quick still though. And this is what's happening behind. This is not the chasing group. This is the third. This is Catherine Indereba, the former world record holder, just beginning to maybe decide I need to try and go from this third group, chase the second group. Well, what gap does she has to does she have to close? Camera on the back of the bike goes a little bit quicker than she can, obviously. And it's quite a big gap, isn't it? That must be all of... Well, at least a couple of hundred yards. And then that's Fernandez, who's already tailed off the back of this second group, which gave chase at the sort of 2.18 pace. And I think that... Maybe they've been caught out by the fact that Paula was running so fast, Chep Kamai, with the two pacemakers just ahead, and Constantina Dita, the only one looking good at the moment behind those two pacemakers. And they, probably, Brendan, the fact that uh, Paula went off at such a fast pace, the others behind her as well. Now, that camera really doesn't give us a good indication, but that big, big gap that Paula had has... Well, it's reduced dramatically, hasn't it? Down to 10.2 seconds. Well, it's amazing that camera can show us as much as it can. Paula Radcliffe there, leading with the two Kenyan pacemakers. Constantina Dita, Susan Chepkamai, Adriana Fernandez in fourth place, and then the chasing group there further down the road. But Paula Radcliffe, just so far, after six miles, is almost two minutes quicker than she ran last year when she set a world best time. So two hours and 18 minutes for Paula Radcliffe last year, and here we are, six miles into the race. Now, Paula Radcliffe has been accompanied by former Olympic silver medalist Peter Elliott on the, on the bike there next to him. Peter, can you tell us what you, what you observe so far? Well, it's interesting that, for obviously, the gap has closed. 
and the fact that obviously Paula has the pacemakers, but she's been quite happy to run off just a few metres behind them and, and obviously take no shelter from the wind or anything like that. But you know, she's running from 5.658 and the last mile was about 5.25. So obviously it looks like, you know, for at some point in the race, we are going to actually have a race on his hands. Well, Paula Radcliffe seems to be quite happy, according to Peter. What you would have to be when you're looking at the way she's running. Her. She's clearly in outstanding form as she goes around the Cutty Sark later this morning. This will be the scene of real action. But Paula Radcliffe on her own, receiving tremendous support from the crowds. And there she is. And remember in December how convincingly she became BBC Sports Personality of the Year. And that event was started with her when she won the London Marathon last year. But here she is, the most popular female athlete in Britain going through there. Tremendous support from the crowd. She tells me she loves the support from the crowd. She really enjoys the idea of this big event. And let's face it, we're looking at a novice, really. She's only run the marathon three times. She ran the fastest time in London last year, then the world's best time in Chicago, and here she is, already rewriting the record books. And the question is, can she keep this pace going, or can she keep anything like this pace going? Because it's a formidable pace that she's setting. The chasing group just coming into Cutty, in the Cutty Sark area now. Constantina Dita. Oh, sorry, this must be the third group because there's Dorado Tulu. There's the second fastest woman of all time in the red vest, Catherine Andereba. Alemu next to Dorado Tulu. And Dina Drossen, who we saw recently finish runner up in the World Cross Country Championships. That's the third group. But there's some talent in that third group, I must say. I just wonder whether it's been a conscious effort of Paula to slow down, ask the pacemakers to slow down. Her husband, Gary Locke, is on the lead vehicle, which is just ahead of these athletes. And, of course, remember last year when Gary was shouting out the mile times? And I'm pretty sure Paula is well aware of what's been happening and maybe consciously wanted to ask them just to peg back a little bit. Well, some of the mini marathon is already underway, and this is the oldest age group for women. Just about to start. So Stephen Redgrave and Todd Carty, the starters for all of these youngsters, 2,000 of them from all over the United Kingdom. And of course, the 33 London boroughs represented. And among some of those uh, athletes who've traveled hundreds and hundreds of miles to get there, Ailish McColgan, Liz McColgan, of course, a former winner of the London Marathon. Her daughter is representing Scotland. Ashley Carr, the daughter of British line rugby player Nigel Carr, representing Ireland. Now then, Cuddy Sark heads down in the wheelchair marathon race and uh, a pretty fast pace being set, Ian. Yeah, we're on about um, 21 minutes. I think we're, again, we're really cracking on here. The first part of the course is very fast. Uh, we're down to four there. It looks like three French men and um, and the lone British guy there. David Weir still in the pack. There's Joel Gino leading at the moment. Joel Gino last weekend uh, was in the Paris Marathon, and I think actually looking at the other couple of French guys were in there as well. He's um, last week he was at 128, and next weekend I think he's over to to Boston as well. So he's going to be um, really the man to be here. I think later on in the race he's going to show his strength. Well, David Weir. The defending champion in the black just to the right hand side of that group but uh, well he really is up against it frenchman working as a team and joel Genot heading all of them and he could be david's biggest threat in this race six miles gone in the wheelchair marathon david still looking fresh just tucked in behind and wearing number one, coming through, he's so aware of what everybody else is doing at the moment. So the defending champion, going well. I'm really not very sure how to introduce this gentleman. He is a portaloo, that's the best way of describing you. Why the outfit today? Uh, I'm, spo I'm raising money for the Water Aid charity, cleaning uh, clean water and sanitation for third world countries. What's your name? My name's Rob Leroy. And where are you from, Rob? Uh, originally from Glasgow, but I live in Norwich. And this looks like it might just get a little hot under yeah. it. Yeah, it will get hot, but I'll, I'll make it. It's PVC, isn't it? 
<laughs> yeah, I like, I like wearing rubber and PVC. I don't think we should be saying that on okay. national television, Rob. Anyway, um, the only one thing I can say is um, I hope you'll be flushed with success by the end. I think I will. I'll be very flushed. Mm. Mm. Right, go to it then. Thank you very much. Thank you. Paula still out in front and the last mile a little bit quicker again than the previous one, 5.12. Still maintaining a decent lead though, but going well behind it. Constantina Dita of Romania. She's not frightened to go out hard, but she's paid for it once or twice before though. She's got a personal best of 2.23, but as you can read there, in the, the world champs in Edmonton, she was a long way ahead in the early stages and faded away badly. And some runners do like to get out hard. It was interesting though that Brendan was saying earlier on how Paula may, may well be looking to run the second half of the race quicker than the first half as we look at Susan Chepkamai here. Again. Around 2.23, her best running faster than that today. And her big claim to fame is run the fastest ever time over the half marathon distance. Set that in Lisbon a couple of years ago. Very fast course there. And going well here today. But they're running well inside their personal best pace, these two athletes. And as I was mentioning, it really is a decision whether you go off hard and try and hang in there or whether you try and set off at a pace, which means you can come home quicker. And that's what Paula has done in her last two marathons, her previous two marathons. She's run the second half of the race quicker than the first half. Now, I can't believe she's going to do that today, though, Brendan. Well, the way she's running the first half of this race today, it'd be staggering if she was able to run the second half quicker because she is operating at an unbelievable... Another five minutes and 12 seconds mile 36 minutes and six seconds for seven miles just unbelievable time Constantina Dita is running quick she's in chef Kamai is running much faster than she's ever run before and Fernandez and then that group behind them Elemu Tulu and others they're still operating at an incredible pace this is the fastest women's race we've ever seen by an awful long way and now the scene at the start of the London Marathon. We've got the elite women on the road and doing their thing. And now the masses, the 35,000 runners that make this the event it really is, being slowly walked to the start. No running on the start the organization of this race, race is absolutely immense. And the people who no do the organization the do a fantastic job. Here at the start, Good Bill Reynolds, the start director. And you can see how well this is orchestrated, keeping gathered there's the baggage it's incredible to me all those bags are exactly the same i wonder how they find them afterwards which one's which but they'll tell us all about that later but the organization that gets those bags of kit necessary kit from here to this to, to the finish so the athletes can collect it it works like clockwork it's a superb feat of organization and this site has now become after this 20 this the 23rd london marathon this site at greenwich park is already the most one of the most famous sites in British sport and the athletes being brought around the corner the anticipation the excitement getting higher really these people need to be controlled and calmed down and that's essential slowly being led towards the start line and the 23rd running of the London Marathon mass event is only minutes away now three starts this is the red start as Brendan was saying for the vast majority of the fun runners the blue start is where the elite athletes go from there they are and then there's a green start for some of the celebrities and euphemistically termed others and number one is the Olympic and world champion Abera first time we've seen him in London more of the elite field shortly but of course, this today a happy occasion, but a sad one as well, because for the first time, the man who created this race will not be here. Sadly, on February 28th, age 74, Chris Brasher died, a man who had already written his place in athletics history, won Olympic gold medal in Melbourne at Steeplechase, and of course helped to pace Roger Bannister to the first sub four minute mile two years previous to that. But then he went to New York in 1979, 
after the New York Marathon and decided he'd like to create something similar in London. And today, the crowd, the runners, get their chance to pay their respects to Chris Brasher. Well, a few moments of silence from the 33,000 athletes who've registered for this 2003 Flora London Marathon. 80,000 people entered the ballots, 41,000 were given entries, 33,000 have turned up on the day. And will Paul Turgap, wearing number two, finally win a big race, his fifth marathon? He's finished second in three occasions, twice here at London. El Muazi is wearing number six. He'll be a big challenger as well. As indeed, as I said earlier on, will be the Olympic champion, Desaheen Abera. So John Disley and Shirley Brasher set them on their way. A sight to behold every single year, one of the greatest sporting occasions on the British calendar and indeed the world calendar. The London Marathon in bright sunshine, perfect conditions, once more gets underway. This is the site that for the last 23 years you, you sit here and you watch this happening and you just feel as though you're in the wrong place. We should be out there, it really does get you going. And this is the event and the image that fills up all the other road races in the country. People sit there and say, if they can do that, I can do that. And that is the challenge of the London Marathon. Absolutely beautiful morning. I think they've got a direct line to heaven this lot because every time they organize the London Marathon, they seem to get superb weather. And after the tension and the waiting at the start, the months and miles of training, the preparation for this event. Some people running for their personal best times, some people running for others, lots of them raising money for charity. Tens of millions of pounds have been raised for charity over the years. I'm over here, Mum. Well, some Mum, somewhere, maybe recognise the person under the sign. But the atmosphere here, everyone will tell you at the start, is absolutely fantastic. And the organisation, the neat organisation, that gets it underway first part of the test for the London Marathon organizers. Bill Reynolds, the start director, is well underway. Nick Patel, the chief executive, and Dave Bedford, the race director, full of nerves until this point gets going, until the race is on its way. And then the organization, and it's a huge organization, swings into action. One of the greatest organized events in the world of any description, and you've got to say, that the organization is aided by the responsibility and the approach of these people. There are policemen out on the course, but they're on a day like today, they're only there to give support. Imperial Cancer Research, you can see a lot of people wearing the plastic bin liner, which they'll eventually discard, timing their own, starting their own watches. They don't trust the official timers. They want their own watch to tell them what they're doing. And from now on, they're in the hands of the organization of the London Marathon. I've got to say, they're in safe hands. Well, it's serious up at the front. And although we call them fun runners, it's pretty serious further back as well. Everybody with their own targets they're aiming at. Times some just wanting to get to the other end. And say that I ran the London Marathon. One of life's great achievements. And over half a million people have now run the London Marathon since Chris Brasher first set the first one underway back in 1981. 
And that figure, Steve, that we mentioned right at the beginning of the programme, £134 million has been raised for charity. And thousands and thousands of uh, charities have benefited from one of the great races, one of the great sporting events the world has ever seen. And some of these athletes coming out of the park, well, they won't be starting or they won't get through the start line for about another 20 minutes. Now, back at Cuddy Sark, they're trying to pick out uh, news of Tanny Gray Thompson and uh, Ian. There she is, just going around the six mile mark. Yeah, it looks as though she's in a nice group there. Uh, just in front of her, again, if you look for the, the women are wearing yellow, uh, bright yellow hat covers. So Tani's third in the group, and just in front of her is uh, Francesca Porcellata. Um, it looks as though it's very competitive there. Tani's taken a bit of a wide berth around the corner there. Tani's in the, uh, the purple top, just on the, the right there. It looks as though she's in the right kind of place at the moment. Um, there's a lot of help there um, if anybody needs it. Uh, John Hanks there with the, the yellow helmet and the blue shirt. Um, looks though like she's very comfortable at the moment. Well, that's good news for Tani Gray. Uh, Francesca Porcellato competed in four Paralympic Games. Obviously, is going to be one of her stiffest competitors. Back with the elite men, their first mile, four minutes and 52 seconds. So a rather more circumspect start by the men than we saw from Paula Radcliffe. It's uh, obviously a long way to go. Most of the big names happy to sit a little bit further back at the moment, letting the pacemakers just take them out through these early stages. Back at Blackheath, a lot of people just going to the start line. And uh, the guy who's just gone out of the picture there, wearing the elephant costume, boy, oh boy, is he going to be a bit hot in about three or four hours' time. And Brendan was talking about the organisers. Let's not forget all the volunteers who turn up year after year. There's over a 1,000 of them at the start. There's over 2,000 at the finish. And around about 3,000 marshals around the 26 and a quarter miles of the course. Every one of them has got their own reason for running this race. Some fantastic stories of human endeavour. There is the start line. They're still coming through and they will be coming through there for about uh, another 10 or 15 minutes. Absolutely perfect conditions. And so many people running this London Marathon course for the first time. One thing is for sure, they will never ever forget this day. Now, the 11 to 12 year old girls race is very special because we've got two sets of twins running for Harrow. Two sets of twins. What's your name? Rachel. Rachel. Megan. Laura. Rebecca. Now, do you all train together as sisters? Do you train a lot? Yeah. 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 Do you race a lot? Yeah. <laughs> you, do you, have, you, have you run a long way before? No. no? So, uh, you're going to beat her? I don't know. You're going to beat her? Yes. <laughs> You're going to beat her? Yeah. You're going to beat her? Yeah. Okay. Have a great time. <laughs> well, there are some of the mini marathoners already underway, some of the older age groups in the women's race. I was talking to Liz McColgan, who's working for BBC Interactive, and she was saying that Ailish, her daughter, who's running in this race, was really looking forward to it, and in Scotland for the very first time. Over 2,000 youngsters from throughout the United Kingdom, but especially a word for all the 33 London boroughs who are represented in this great race today. Well, some way back, there is the Tower of London at the 12-mile mark before they go into Docklands. And it's Dennis Lemunier who's leading by just a second from David Weir, the defending champion, Nanari of Australia, and Joel Jeannot, the fastest man in the field, who's some way ahead of Tushar Patel back in fifth place. Now, a word about the, uh, the women, Ian. Hey, look, I, I saw Deborah Brennan in the pack as well. So um, I think she's on for a very, very good push today. Um, Paula Craig's not too far behind. Um, again, Paula Craig, interesting. She, I think she's the first woman who's actually run the race and then actually done it in a wheelchair as well. Yes, yeah, a phenomenal achievement. And there 
is after 10 kilometres, around about six miles. Not too far behind there, heading towards Tower Bridge shortly. Going through rather high at the moment. Past the 10 mile mark is Paula Radcliffe, still out in front. Husband Gary on that lead vehicle leg, giving her all the information she needs, and the information is she's still running very, very fast. 5.13 for that 10th mile, 51 minutes and 48 seconds. Just to put that into perspective, Brendan, uh, there aren't many women in the world can run that for 10 miles, just, uh, just running a 10-mile race flat out without having to run the rest of the distance. That's exactly right. 51.48 for 10 miles means that she's operating at sub-2 hours 16 pace. And there's a serious bit of distance behind her, but there's a more aggressive piece of running to be done in the second half of the race. She has to keep this pace going. She's ignored the, lead, the chasing group, and I'm surprised that the chasing group are that close. 36 seconds behind her. She's moving away. She's almost two and a half minutes quicker at this point than she was when she ran last year. And remember, last year, she became one of only three women who've ever run under two hours 20 for a marathon. And here she is operating closer to two hours 15 than she is to two hours 20. So Paula Radcliffe, followed by Constantina Dita, who's f known as a front runner, but to be a front runner in a race like today was absolutely impossible. She couldn't run quick enough to stay with Paula Radcliffe. I don't think she could even run quick enough to stay with Paula Radcliffe at the 10K point, but she really is down to her running, down to her serious business, following her pacemakers, and just behind Constantina Dita, there we can see the fastest half marathon runner of all time, Susan Chepkamai. But Paula Radcliffe said before the race, Susan Chepkamai could run a good marathon. Well, I'm sure Paula's right, and this is an excellent marathon, and it's an excellent performance so far from Susan Chepkamai, but Paula has reduced this to an endurance test. There's no jogging for position today. It's all about how hard they can run and how fast they can run and how long they can keep going at this sort of pace. But that is a talented Kenyan athlete, Susan Chepkamai. We're back with the men. Three pacemakers in the front there. And Bongju Lee of Korea, Olympic silver medalist back in uh, Atlanta, 96, is the first of the elite athletes. But a very steady start for the men 453 for the second mile and that's uh, very easy running indeed so a different uh, set of tactics than we're seeing in the women's race of course Canucci the man who broke the world record in this event last year not here had to pull out just uh, four weeks ago which was a big disappointment but we still have a very very top class field here El Moaziz He's won this race on a couple of occasions before. He just went through wearing number six. And uh, Paul Turgat, I mentioned earlier on, wearing number two. He's on the far side, the tall figure. There he is. A lot of people would love to see Paul Turgat win this, I think. The man who, of course, has finished second on the track so many times to Haile Gebri Selassie. Well, it looks as though there's been a breakaway in the men's wheelchair race here. Yeah, as you know, it looks as though he's made a break. Uh, Tower Bridge is, is very much one of the key points in the race. It's the first real hard hill, and looks as though he's managed to bit, make a bit of a breakaway there. Hopefully the groups behind can actually start to organise themselves and maybe try and chase him down, because, again, we've still got a long way to go on this one. Well, we certainly have. We're keeping an eye out, obviously, for David Weir, the defending champion. Seven times winner of the London Marathon, David, and he's progressed through to the senior ranks beautifully now at 23 years old, but at the moment... Joel Genot, the fastest man in the field before this race. Looks as though he's stolen a real march on the rest, and there is David Weir in second place. I think as David, again, working with uh, Dennis Lemunier there in, uh, with, for second and third place, if those two can work together, they can work really well. But again, with um, you can some of the cycling tactics may come into this, and so I'm not sure how how hard the French guy is actually going to work to help David pull him back up to uh, Jules Genet. Well, he's about 20 seconds or thereabouts ahead of uh, David Weir and uh, Denis Lemunier came into uh, the 2001 London Marathon as a late entrant, but then he won by two minutes. So two former champions being led by Joel Genot of France at the moment. David Weir, just a bit of freewheeling there. And this could be very useful for David, at least if 
fast competitor alongside him, so they can work together. Yeah, it does help in the later stage. If there are a couple of people together, again, you can do a little bit of work, and as David's doing there, sit behind and take a bit of a break. You, you, can, you can go through the race then and do half as much work as you normally would do. You really want to be with somebody. So the next target, Docklands, and then, of course, they head for home. But this is about 12-mile mark, as David Weir just looks behind it, but it looks as though the top three competitors are really pulling away from the rest at the moment. A little bit further back, the men heading towards the three-mile mark. And we have a phalanx of pacemakers at the moment at the front, and the, to be fair, most of the big names are sitting, what, 15, 20 metres further back and uh, playing a cagey game at this early stage, Brendan, just looking at each other and letting the pacemakers just pull away a little bit. They'll have to that 4.35, that, well, that's the quickest mile, and maybe that's why that gap's there. 14.20 through three miles. Just to reiterate, this is a fast part of the course, and that sort of thing tends to happen. But uh, they certainly look to be looking at each other rather than pushing on at this early stage. Complete contrast in the men's race. And the, lead, the women's leader, leader, Paula Radcliffe. Just having a look at her time there through 11 miles, 56 minutes, 48 seconds, 5.10 for that mile. And this is absolutely incredible piece of distance running. She's actually running now three minutes faster at this stage in the race than she was last year. Let's face it, last year she ran tactically, she ran opening conservatively and then came back extremely quickly. This, day, this time it's a completely different approach. It's Paula Radcliffe pushing back the barriers, testing herself, testing herself against the distance and also testing the limits of female endurance running. She really is at the top of her form. She showed it last summer on the track. And Peter Elliott on the, on the bike there, who's been a very close observer of Paula Radcliffe's whole career, and now is probably like us enjoying this part of it. Peter, is she running a bit aggressively, do you think? I think she is running aggressively. The atmosphere down here is absolutely incredible. Everybody's shouting her name from balconies everywhere, and it must be hard for Paula not to get carried away with the emotion and enthusiasm there is down here, but you know, the last mile, 5.04, uh, she's quite happy to just still sit just slightly off the off the pacemakers there, but uh, it's incredible. It's you know to have the privilege to be sat here watching this is incredible. It's a little easier. Peter sitting there watching it than it is what she's doing, isn't it? Well, Peter there, put his microphone down and just observing this and enjoying it as he said. And this is really a phenomenal piece of distance running. And Paula Radcliffe said the other day at the press conference she really enjoys the marathon. She feels more comfortable at the marathon. And if you look at her. Over the years, style has been commented on and criticised, but I tell you what, if you look at it from the waist down and you look at the economy of action of Paula Radcliffe, you look at the style that she has, look at the stride, and look at how balanced and controlled she is. She really is a phenomenal athlete, and I don't think I think people have actually worried too much about a bobbing head because, quite frankly, it doesn't really matter when you're as an economic and stylish as that. And in second place, we've got Constantina Dieter, but further down the field, gaps to Constantina Dieter, who's a well-known front-runner, there looking down the road, we can see she's out of sight. And there, Catherine and Dereva in fourth place. Now she's coming back. She set off very conservatively. I was a little bit surprised the way she did that, but now the second fastest woman marathon runner of all time is now deciding that her way to run it is still to go conservatively, and another 5.16 mile for Paula Radcliffe at 12 miles, an hour and two minutes, and this is phenomenal running. It really is. Gary Locke, her husband, former Irish, Northern Irish record holder for 1,500 metres, he's on the following, he's on the lead bike there. He must be getting nervous like we are. And still back at the start, the men are four miles down the road and still got well, the lifeboat's on its way now. Well, those guys deserve a medal. They're not even through the start gantry yet, but uh, some 17 minutes after the official klaxon went to start the masses. There's still a couple of thousand people to go through the start at Blackheath. So the Royal National Lifeboat Institution will be benefiting from their exploits, that's for sure. And look at this, they're still pouring through the gate. So many charities, of course, will benefit. Juvenile Diabetes Foundation, led by Humphrey Walters and Bruff Scott, who's 60 years old now. Former jockey, broadcaster and writer, of course. 
speaking to those guys last night and they were looking forward so much to their experience here, not least because juvenile diabetes will benefit to the tune of many hundreds of thousands of pounds as a result of this year's exploits, along with so many other charities. So a team of what? One, two, three, four, five, six, six people. I wonder if they can stay together for the whole 26 miles. Well, heading towards Tower Bridge, the only real incline on this course. Paula Radcliffe now with a lead approaching one minute, and that gives you some indication of how, of how fast she's running, because by my calculations, the first three or four women, certainly down to Endereva, are running inside 2.20 pace. And there's only uh, Paula and Endereva have done that before. Or three athletes have actually done that before, so Paula dragging the others to a fast time as well. Climbing across the bridge, and this is where the big crowds are. Huge support for Paula Radcliffe. Certainly, well, she was the BBC Sports Personality of the Year last year, the most popular athlete around at the moment, perhaps the most popular sports person. And this, the point at which last year she said she really felt the crowds push her on. She started to get faster at this point last year. I'm not sure she's going to be able to do that this time round. She's gone so quickly through the first 12 miles of this race this year I just want to talk about the pacemakers a little bit Brendan I mean we've we've mentioned it we see some stats on Tower Bridge there but these pacemakers uh, are doing a good job and I know we've talked about uh, okay it's a mixed race and you're allowed to run a mixed race but I know that there's been some consternation about the fact that uh, this has been allowed or been allowed here today and I know one or two people have said well if you can do it in the marathon why aren't they allowed to do it on the track why can't you have male pacemakers over 10,000 meters on the track because to be honest if Paula Radcliffe is ever to rate a world record on the track she might have to employ men if she needs a pacemaker why is that then well I think this is going to change the whole face of distance running at the end of the day Paula Radcliffe is a professional athlete she trains extremely hard and here she is now trying to run as fast as she possibly can and the fact of the matter is there aren't any women fast enough to pace her at this pace so obviously if she's allowed it if she can use men to help her run quickly why should she be denied the opportunity of running at the limit of her personal best because of, just because of the fact there aren't any women quick enough so i think it's a good thing for paula active to be assisted by men I think it's going to help her overall, and really, if, let's face it, distance running is about achieving your limits, and if men pacemakers can help you achieve your limits, then I don't think that's a problem. Constantina Dita running a fabulous in second place. She's paying the price already, though, you can sense that, just taking very, very deep breaths here, and the crowds on Tower Bridge this year are absolutely packed, and the polar actor, the cheer Paula Rack they've got, as she's now approaching the halfway point, absolutely incredible, but she'll need it now, She's running so much faster than she ran last year, almost three minutes faster at this stage of the race than she ran last year when she ran the... Th and there's the second fastest woman of all time coming, running her own race, Catherine Dereva, moving through the field and moving through the pace very, very quickly. Oh, now, I think things have changed at the back of the group because there's Fernandez in fourth place. There's now Susan Chepkamai, who we saw earlier on, the fastest half marathon runner of the world. I'm just going to keep an eye out for her. I just wonder if she's gone through the shot without us noticing. Otherwise, things have changed pretty dramatically. That looks like Susan Chepkamai going around the corner. And down here, that's third place Chepkamai. Fourth place we're looking for now. And I think this is going to be Catherine and Dereba. There's Fernandez. Well, there's something going wrong here because we think I think we've missed one of the runners. I think we've missed Susan Chepkamai, who was running so strongly before. Now I don't think she'll have dropped out because. So, so there's Fernandez, Dina Drossen in that chasing group, Dorado Tulu in that chasing group, Alemu of Ethiopia in that chasing group. Well, you're right, Brendan. Uh, Susan Chepkamai is still in third place. She's fairly distant from Dita, but Endereba is closing down on her. This was through 20 kilometres, 64 minutes and 28 seconds. 
for Paula Radcliffe. And that is a very, very quick running indeed. As we've already mentioned, heading for something inside two minutes and 16 seconds. And the other athletes, certainly down to Endereba, are running inside 2.20 pace as well. So one of the greatest women's marathons in prospect here in terms of times. May not be a great race about who's going to win it, but Paula Radcliffe just running against the clock. She's so familiar with that, happy with that, happy to do that, happy to push the barriers, happy to set targets nobody else is prepared to set. And she's once more showing what a talent she is. It's taken her many, many years to get to this point, Paula. Many heartaches on the track. And now showing how good she is at the marathon. Well, the last one's uh, just going through the start. And they're uh, still walking, not allowed to run yet, not quite able to get moving, but that won't do them any harm whatsoever with so many miles ahead of them. Always told to take it easy in the first few miles. Good advice. And certainly for, for some of the first-timers, can get a little bit carried away early on. But uh, now the last of the 33,000 coming through those gates. Well, back to the Tower of London and just looking for Tanny Gray Thompson, who's in about third, fourth, fifth place in that group there. And Francesca Pocciolato, she's got 61 on the front of her wheelchair. So things still looking pretty good for Tanny. Yeah, it actually looks as though there's another woman who's actually made it up to the pack as well. Um, Rachel Potter from Manchester, again, just behind Tanny at the moment. Um, she's been going very strongly, again, just coming through the picture now. Won Manchester Marathon last year, and I think would be, um, again, maybe not too happy that she's made it up to the leading group. I'm well, just looking to see if uh, Paula Craig is in that group as well. You were mentioning her the last time we saw the uh, split times at 10 kilometres. She finished uh, 45th in the London Marathon. Uh, as an able-bodied runner back in the year 2000, but uh, as soon as she had her accident where she was knocked off a bicycle when training for a triathlon in 2001, within a couple of weeks of the accident, she was already planning to train for wheelchair events. So we'll keep an eye on for her. She'll have 66 on her wheelchair, but Tani, we can't quite get a good picture of her there. But uh, obviously struggling coming up that uh, bit of the course, aren't they? It's deceptive because it's, it is actually quite a climb for the wheelchairs on that. Again, you only have one gear on a wheelchair, so you can't really change gears as you're moving up. But it looks as though she's comfortably gone through there. And again, she'll be, she'll be able to pick up some speed on the downhill and probably get back to Francesca Porcellata. So Porcellata it is who's leading the way. Completed uh, four Paralympic Games, three medals in the Paralympics uh, from distances ranging from 100 metres all the way up to 800 metres, just adjusting a helmet. And this is a little bit of a rest for them after the grind of going across the apex of Tower Bridge. And Tanny Gray Thompson certainly in that group. And at the moment, still going well. Oh, Steve, what do you think about this? I mean, there are ways of making running a marathon difficult. These are the last uh, group of people, men and women, to just about go through the finish gantry. What on earth are they doing? I think they'll sail through, Paul, really. What are they doing? Maybe they're going to get to Tower Bridge and then hope that nobody's looking, throw it in the water, jump in and uh, sail down to Westminster and then get out again. Who Maybe. knows? Maybe. I hope to goodness they are raising money for somebody because that is going to be very, very hard indeed. And back at Blackheath, well, the cleaning up process has already started. The talk about cleaning up. Paula Radcliffe has gone through halfway. And uh, I'll come back to that split in a second. She went through halfway in 68 minutes and two seconds. Has just passed 14 miles. That last mile there, five minutes and eight seconds. And of course, this is the point at which she ran quickly last year, Brendan, when she picked it up from between sort of 13, 14, 14, 15 miles. That was when we really knew uh, she was on for something special last year. And really comparing this year's race with last year's race, as you said, she's about a couple of minutes ahead of that. We really should be comparing it a little bit more with what she did in Chicago, and she's well ahead of that pace as well, still running inside 216 pace. It's, it's difficult to put into words what that means. It's really difficult to compare it. It's like
the 100 metres on the track going and suddenly running a couple of tenths faster than anybody's done before. She really is completely rewriting the way in which women approach the marathon distance. Certainly doing that. And that opening half, 68 minutes and two seconds for the first half of Paula Radcliffe's marathon. And let's face it, there's Susan Chepkamai, and I think she's in third place. But Paula Radcliffe, 68 minutes and two seconds for the first half of the marathon. Last is faster than any woman athlete ran for a half marathon anywhere last year. So she's opened the race with a halfway score of 68 minutes. And if she's actually technically picking up the pace, then this is incredible. She's operating two hours 16 pace, which is what she said she was going to do. Or she didn't say it, but there were clues there. And now the men's race in a completely different manner. Paula Radcliffe stringing them out, testing them all, stretching them all and the men running competitively behind the pacemakers and very sensibly too. Well, we've still got the three pacemakers at the front. They've gone through six miles and we've got two Korean athletes following them at the moment. But no real break at this point and the pace has been fairly steady. There you can see that quick third mile followed by a 447, 443 and a 454. And that's steady pace, as I said. But there are so many good athletes in this race that I think we'll not see too much happening until beyond halfway. That's usually the case in the men's race. The women often get spread out at a much earlier stage. The men, there's such as the high caliber. We had the Paris Marathon just last week, Brendan, and four men finished inside two minutes and seven seconds. And if you remember what happened la here last year with Kanuchi, Gabriel Selassie and Turgat, phenomenal performance. Turgat finished second and still run inside two minutes and six, ran the second fastest time ever. I'm not sure that we'll see anything quite as fast as that this year. They're running at a steady enough pace. It's still a little bit cagey for my money. They're all looking at each other. Well, don't forget, if you've got interactive television and you uh, get fed up with listening to Brendan and I, perhaps, you can always keep an eye on what's happening in the women's race. If you just want to keep track of everything that's happening with Paula Radcliffe and don't want to take your eyes away from her, but a good choice there for you. You can choose if you have interactive. And why wouldn't you want to sit and watch Paula? Complete coverage of the London Marathon in all its aspects. Paula certainly stealing the show at the moment. Cutty Sark. You're going to li like this, uh, Brendan. Last night, I went on a little boat trip, and they dropped me off at Greenwich Pier. I was meant to be picked up by a taxi. I was waiting right by the uh, cutting pier, and I was locked in. I had to climb over a 10-foot fence. Not a soul was there. A policeman came down and asked me what I was doing. I promised him I wasn't trying to um, get a good vantage spot for this morning. But it was uh, a lot quieter at 10.30 uh, last night than it is now. Well, I'll teach you to stay out late on a Saturday night in London, <laughs> Steve. Doesn't do you any good, does it? I'm not going to get any boats down the Thames anymore. We're getting quite a few text messages and uh, one or two emails as well. And one of the, uh, the big questions is, why is Paula Radcliffe wearing gloves? Keep her hands warm. <laughs> I was just about to say that, Brendan. I don't really know. It's quite a warm day today. And... Uh, a lot of the women were wearing gloves, not the men, though. They've decided uh, to disperse with that. Temperature obviously picked up a little bit more. The women started 45 minutes before the men, but certainly a warm enough spring day here in London. You wouldn't would have needed hats and gloves. Well, through 10 kilometres, there you can see Lagat is a pacemaker, Caterino is a pacemaker, Stefano Baldini from Italy, well up there, the bronze medalist from the World Championships, Ebera, the Olympic champion, world champion from Ethiopia in that leading group. All the big names are there, though. Still all together. Well, Paula Radcliffe approaching City Pride. I will be interviewing lots of the fun runners later on. Paula won't be stopping for anything, though. Last mile, five minutes and ten seconds. Relentless pace. She's not slowing at all. We've seen her go through even quicker through the first half marathon or the first half of the race than we've ever seen before and that has not slowed her she is still running at a pace which will bring her well inside her own world record and every mile that clicks away
Lines, the certainty of that happening. No sign yet of fatigue kicking in, but the marathon can creep up on you, though. It can attack you in just the last few miles. So many times we've seen the best in the world seem to be in control, seem to be cruising along, seem to be knowing exactly what they're doing. And then, for whatever reason, things start to go wrong in just the last few miles. We've never seen that from Paula before. Actually, Brendan, she ran the, the only race uh, she has run this year was in Puerto Rico, where she broke her own, or she broke the world record for 10 kilometers. And in that race, she started off with the men in a mixed race, a real mixed race, and actually ran with Paul Turgat and the other big names for the first mile or two. She went very, very fast in that race through the first five kilometers. And I think by her own admission, it was the first time that she really suffered in the last mile or so of that race. That was only over 10 kilometers. So she knows what it's like to her. We've seen Paula do that so many times on the track as well. But today, so far, very much in control. Five minutes, that last mile, maintaining this very, very quick pace. Well, the advancement in women's distance running over the years has really been demonstrated by people like Paula Radcliffe, Tecla LaRoupe and Ingrid Christensen. And if you go back 10 years, the distance, the gap between the men's record and the women's record for the marathon was 14 minutes. Five years ago, it was still about 14 minutes. And now, thanks to Paula Radcliffe's effort in Chicago, it's now 11 minutes and 40 seconds, the difference between Canucci's world record and Paula Radcliffe's world best. And I think today we may even see a narrowing in that. So the gap between the, the world record for the marathon for the men and the world record in the marathon for the women is definitely narrowing. Today, I think that gap could even be a little bit tighter. Years and years ago, it was 20 and 25 minutes. Now we're down to 11 minutes and 40 seconds between the fastest man in the world and the fastest woman in the world. And I wonder if Paul is going to take it close to the 10-minute gap. It really is significant advancement in female distance running. And you need the attitude of an athlete like Paula Radcliffe. And in previous years, you needed an athlete like Ingrid Christensen to push back these barriers. But certainly, they are breaking down the barriers. The women are getting quicker, and they're getting closer to the men. Through seven miles, 4.52. The seventh mile, maintaining the sort of pace they've been running at. As I said, fairly steady, nothing too spectacular. But all, all of the big city marathons now run at a good pace. Gone are the days where you could turn up to London, New York, Chicago and uh, hope to steal a victory. You are up against the best in the world and expect to run fast. And if you can't run inside two minutes and seven seconds, at the very least, you're not going to win. Well, that lead group has three pacemakers at the very front there, wearing 33, 36, 35. In fact, four pacemakers there. Number 11 is one of the Korean athletes, Kim Yong Kim. He has run inside 2.8. But it's really just behind them. You've got El Moziz wearing number six, Bong Ju Lee wearing number eight. Paul Turgat a little bit further back, he's wearing number two. Just uh, trying to pull that group up to them. At the moment, all still very tightly packed. And just keeping an eye on each other, as I said earlier on, it's always interesting to see what tactics are adopted amongst the men when there's so many good athletes there. Somebody really has to have the confidence, not at this stage, but perhaps in... Uh, Another five or six miles time to start to push on, to start and try to break this group up. El Moziz has done that in the past. Another he sat and waited. I was talking to his manager the other evening at the hotel, and he says he's an athlete who just likes to train hard. He doesn't race too often, El Moziz, but he loves the marathon distance. He loves London. Has never been outside the top five here. There he is. First the best, 2.646 set here in London. And by all accounts, has come here in very good shape. And with the absence of Canucci, he's probably one of the three favourites. I think Moses, Abera, and Paul Turgat are most people's favourites to win this race. Early stages yet, though. He looks comfortable enough. There's Lee Bonjou. Former Olympic silver medalist. Looking 
comfortable enough in that early in the uh, early stages in that lead group. Not as many pacemakers for the men. There wasn't the uh, necessity to have different pacemakers running at different paces. They just have to accept that you either go with this lead group, otherwise you're on your own. Brendan, uh, I've talked about Elmo Aziz a little bit further back in the, the group just behind these is Paul Turgat. I was talking about him earlier on. There he is, tall figure, closest to the camera, wearing number two. And uh, Turgat, yes, last year, of course, running a superbly fast time, but finishes second. He's finished second so many times in his career, of course. It was cross-country, won five titles on the cross-country, but he's never really won a big one on the track or yet in the marathon. Could this be his day? Great cross country running his time, Paul Turgat. But let's face it, the reason he hasn't won on the track is because of the great highly Gabriel Selassie. If it hadn't been for Gabriel Selassie, this would be looking at the most B medaled athlete of all time. Then when he came on the roads, he met Khalid Canucci, breaking world records to beat him. So he's a phenomenal athlete, Paul Turgat. Khalid Canucci isn't here today. Highly Gabriel Selassie isn't here today. And I wonder if this could be the day when Paul Turgat comes of age in the marathon the second fastest marathon runner of all time. And next to him, in the absence of Haile Gebri Selassie, is the Ethiopian Olympic champion, Gezahina Bera, number one. The man who says, already Olympic champion, already the world champion, the only man to do so. And he says, when I get a bit older and a little bit stronger, I'll try to run a bit faster. And that's not many people who are already late reigning Olympic world champions can actually say that and I think he means that he is getting better he is getting stronger and we anticipate a big race from number one Gezahin Abera of Ethiopia still a long way to go on the men's race the women's race of course much further down the course well back at Kadisa the face is familiar, the gait slightly different than it was when she was running for Great Britain. Steve, a word about the great Zola Bud. Well, I was chatting to Zola yesterday, great to see her back in London. She came here last summer on a 10K race, but she's been absolutely astounded by the media coverage and the support she's had for her quest to uh, take part in the London Marathon. She said uh, she came here thinking she could run about two minutes and 40 seconds, which, to be fair, given that she uh, hasn't really been training that hard for too long, is uh, pretty good running indeed, but uh, she's a bit worried that people are expecting a bit much from her, but it's great to see her back in London. And, uh, well, given the fact that Paul has fallen over a couple of times recently, Brendan, including uh, falling over uh, while she was out training recently, she did last year, of course, with uh, Marianne Sutton. She's probably glad, glad that Zola's further back, because, uh, of course, Zola, one thing she was famous for was the collision with Mary Decker in 1984. But uh, no collisions so far for Paula Radcliffe. She's kept out of the way of all of the bikes and is still moving serenely on. Five minutes and 13 seconds. And at what point, Brendan, is, is some of this going to take its toll, or will it? Just the head starting to bob a little bit more there. It's always difficult to tell with Paula, isn't it, when she's really hurting? Well, I think she's working hard now, I really do. She says she's learning in the marathon, obviously, she's only run twice, and this is only her third one. But she says when she was running in London last year, she went through a bad patch at 18 miles. Well, we're just about approaching the 18-mile point. And then when she ran Chicago, she didn't go through a bad patch till 22 miles. But she figures in this race today, psychologically, that at some point she will go through a bad patch. When you run as quickly as she's done in the opening stages, you run 68 minutes in the first half of the race, then you're bound to go through a bad patch. But Paula mentally is prepared for it, as well as physically prepared for it. And around her, she's got a fabulous team. Alex Stanton, her coach, part of Team Radcliffe. Andy Jones, a physiologist. Jared Hartman, a physiotherapist, and her husband, Gary Locke. And she says if it wasn't for Jared Hartman, sometimes she wouldn't be in the races in, in, in the shape she is. He really does get her ready for this, these races, particularly the London Marathon. He's been London Marathon. He's been travelling with her, keeping her ready, giving her up to two hours of physiotherapy every day. And the physical specimen that Paula Radcliffe is does owe a lot to Jared Hartman's technique and ability. But she really is working hard now. You can tell when Paula's working hard. Just the head bobs a little. She grimaces a little. She has to work harder, but the thing about Paula, 5.07 for the 6.17, the mile up to 17 miles, and that's as, as quick as she went last year. So really, she now is trying to attack this marathon. 
brilliant piece of running. And there we look at the, the masses at Cuddy Sark now. This is the real London Marathon. The elite one is fantastic for we who are interested in athletics and distance running, but this is what makes the London Marathon. And the Cuddy Sark, a big campaign on to try and raise the money to keep it in place. They need 10 million pounds for the Cuddy Sark Trust to keep it in operation. And the music on the course really does keep the runners going. They really do appreciate this. And this is the sight and sound of the London Marathon. Fabulous day out. And these people have run many, many miles in training, hours of preparation and getting ready for it. And we're looking at the sharp end of the race here. These are the men running around out around about two hours 30, two hours 40 minutes for the marathon. Well, you're right, Brendan. We uh, should give mention to all of the club runners. I was looking on the BBC website yesterday and uh, just to underline that, there was an email from Kirsty Huntingdon saying, give the club runners a mention. They certainly add to the London Marathon. She's from Blythe Athletic Club. Her mother runs for Mansfield Harriers. And they've got a few runners hoping to get under three hours here today. And that in itself is no mean achievement. You have to put a lot of miles in, train hard, if you're going to run under three hours. Even for those who run a lot slower than that, they will have put lots of hard work into their preparation. And the Cutty Sark, the first of the landmark sites that they'll see on what will be hopefully four or five hours of, well, we can't call it pure enjoyment because it does, it does hurt. And talking about hurting, Endereba is starting to make one or two of the other athletes hurt because they've got them. She's making up ground on those ahead of her who went off a little bit quicker. Susan Chepkamai being one of them and Constantina Dita being the other. And uh, Endereba has now moved into second place. We just saw Dita going through. There's Chepkamai, who now finds herself in fourth. And Endereba may well have just paced this one right. And uh, she is certainly the second best marathon runner in the world at the moment behind Paula Radcliffe and showing that she has good pace judgment. Let the others follow some of the pace that Paula had set. Sat back a little bit and now reaping the benefits of that. What about Paula though? How has she judged her pace? Still running fast, just clocked as Brendan said, a five minutes and seven second mile for the previous one. And this is more difficult through this part of the course. You're getting tired. The crowds aren't as big. Going through the Canary Wharf area before she starts to turn back towards the Tower of London again and the crowds pick up. But this is a difficult part of the race. You really do have to concentrate hard, keep working, keep the rhythm going as much as anything else. And when you're running this sort of distance, rhythm is what you tend to rely on. Just keep pushing, pushing, pushing as we pass where the uh, expo is held, where all the athletes, all the runners come to register over the previous two, three days, just passing there on the Left-hand side of your picture, the London Arena. The Paula, that inimitable style of hers, the head nodding just slightly. That will become more pronounced the more tired she gets. Nobody in sight, just the pacemakers still with her. I think she's finding this tough now. I think she's working harder, you can tell. You look at her legs and the rhythm is there, but you can see she's just forcing it a little now. She was drifting along in the early stages and now she's working for it. But the one thing about Paula Radcliffe, she's prepared to work for her performances. She really is. Over the years, when you look at her now, she's in the peak of her form and the peak of her career. But over the years, from 1993, she tried to win medals on the track. And there's the second place there, Catherine Dereva looks very smooth and very confident. She's moved through quick from the halfway point, and her race was a conservative one. She opened in 70 minutes for the first half. She was two minutes behind Paula Radcliffe at the halfway point, and she's beginning to move and close on that now. Catherine Dereva looks so economic. The marathon looks to be her event. Her track distance times aren't very impressive. She's a couple of minutes slower than Paula Radcliffe, over 10,000 meters. And really, she doesn't run too much other than on the roads, but you can tell just by looking at her that the marathon suits Catherine Dereva. 
Well, the 18 mile point. Now I'm sure that's the time for Paula Radcliffe. 5 11. 1 hour 33 minutes, 19 seconds. And Paula Radcliffe continuing to work the pace. Catherine and Dereba getting to this point more economically, more calculatingly than Paula. But Catherine Dereba, the second fastest marathon runner of all time behind Paula Radcliffe in her true position. Well, the cobbled streets of Tower Bridge just uh, by the Tower Thistle Hotel there, and it looks as though Jean Genot of France has got about a two-minute lead over the defending champion David Weir and fellow Frenchman Denis Le Meunier, so he's going extremely well, Ian. Yeah, this is a difficult point within the race. Again, it's you get up to about 20-mile mark, and then the granite sets across the, the cobbles. Uh, for the last few times I've done it. Again, you get to a point where you're getting a little bit tired and then imagine someone taking you by the shoulders and just shaking you for about two or three minutes. And then you've got to get out there and do another five miles. Uh, Joel Genot, prolific performer in marathons all over the world last year. One in Paris, second in Berlin, fourth in Los Angeles. Uh, this uh, really is first serious attack at London as he now goes onto the carpet, which uh, certainly will help but it's still a very tough part of the course indeed. And there we have it, and uh, almost spot on there, Ian. You were telling me it was about two minutes, slightly under that, but Lemunier and David Weir are still locked together in second and third place. Yeah, I saw David pushing along. I think they're, the two of them are going to be working together, but I think David's going to have an eye on the finish there. Again, they're about 30 minutes away from the finish, and I don't think Dave's going to try and save some of his sprint from the end. Dennis will be trying to work him really hard to, to take some of that out of him, but I think Dave should be the, the winner on the end of the second place. Well, well uh, I'm sure we will see David Weir. Uh, you'll recognise him instantly. He's wearing all black, a black helmet, black uh, shirt as well. The one convincingly last year, but uh, that gap, I think, is getting a wee bit bigger. Joel Genot well away from them at the moment. And David Weir, well, he's been with Dennis Lemunier. Here they come. It's Lemunier actually just ahead of Weir. The uh, Frenchman won the London Marathon in 2001. Then it was David Weir the year after. But uh, both of them being headed by a considerable distance by Joel Genot of France. I think David was maybe hoping for a repeat of last year where, again, we had a big bunch of French guys coming over. But unfortunately, the top guys managed to find all the, um, the glass that was in London. And so we had about four people playing out there with, with punches. Um, again, French probably look on their side this year, but David looks to be making a bit of a break into the cobbles. If you can here, then again, I think he can have a bit of a steady run through and let make, make Dennis Lemunia really chase him, and that will take more out of him. Well, certainly David Weir is a good sprinter, but uh, he's got a lot of distance to make up on Joel Genot, the fastest man in the field, and uh, the Frenchman at least a couple of minutes ahead, but for the first time, really, since the start, David Weir is really piling the pressure now on Dennis Lemunia. He's just got about a two or three second lead over the uh, Frenchman. And two Frenchmen in the top three, a remarkable performance from those two guys. But are we going to see a new champion this year? Well, all money on uh, last year's champion repeating her performance in the women's race. Just a question of how fast is she going to run? Taking more fluid on board there. She's been drinking. Fairly regular, it's not too much. The lead, two minutes and 20 seconds. Now that says previously 134, but that wasn't uh, Endereba. And Endereba has moved into second place now, has judged her race well. Is still running under 220 pace, well under 220 pace Endereba, because Paula is heading for something, if she keeps this pace up, inside 216, which would be absolutely phenomenal. Well, we've got Peter Elliott on the lead bike there, but just before we talk to Peter, we just got some information from Paula Radcliffe. At 30 kilometres, she's already run the fastest time. She's already broken a world record at 30 kilometres in the middle of the marathon. That's absolutely phenomenal. Beat the best previous time over 30 kilometres by 64 seconds. Well, I don't think I've ever seen that before. Three quarters of the race, she's setting world best times, and that's incredible. One hour, 36 minutes and 36 seconds. Peter, Re Peter Elliott. What about that? Paula Radcliffe setting world best en route in the marathon. 
incredible down here because I think an indication of the pace that she's going at is uh, Christopher Candy, the Kenyan pacemaker. He's some 150 metres behind now. He's uh, he's had enough. But uh, it's just a matter of it. Obviously, the other pacemaker's doing a grand job. The crowd down here is absolutely tremendous. The atmosphere is incredible, but she just keeps pushing along. And, uh, you know, it's just the support is, is, is fantastic. But it's just incredible to watch Paula. Obviously, the training she's been doing, we've heard about was Hamdi in Albuquerque, but obviously, Alex and Rosemary Stanton and Jared Hartman and her husband Gary was up there on the lead vehicle, keeping a very close eye on what's happening. But uh, it's a great team, and obviously the rewards, rewards are what we're seeing today. Thanks, Peter. Well, what we're seeing is a phenomenal piece of running by Paula Radcliffe. Still no signs of her slowing down. She's just completed the previous mile in five minutes and seven seconds again. That's through 19 minutes. And as Brendan was saying, Nobody has even run this quickly for this distance. If they stopped at this point, never mind having to run another seven miles or so. And Paula just pouring it on all the time. And I think this is the most difficult part of the course. If she keeps it going through here, she starts to pick up the crowds again as she heads towards the Tower of London and then along the embankment, she'll be clicking up the miles in her own head as well. And if with every mile that goes by, she knows that that world record is getting closer. Endereva not getting closer, but she's still running well in second place. Well, the region not getting closer is because of this. I, I've watched, been involved in athletics for many, many years, but I've never seen a distance race where we've had a world record set en route at three quarters distance. It's absolutely fantastic. It's like, it's like in a 1500 meter race. She's shouting for something there. She's some help. But it's like a 1500 meter race. It's like somebody breaking the world record at 1200 meters on route, Steve. And you know that's not, you know that's not possible. Well, this is incredible. It really is. And there we are at Cutty Sark. The masses filling up at Cutty Sark. They won't be conscious. They won't be conscious of what's going on ahead of them. He won't be conscious except he's got a great view from up there. And the masses and the crowds, the phenomenal performance at the front, is being aped by a phenomenal piece of action here, look at this, to the Cuddy Sark, what a glorious sight, if you're sitting at home watching, I bet you're thinking like I am, I wish I was out there doing it. Absolutely brilliant, and that's why the London Marathon, in many ways, is so successful, some of the tremendous landmarks, and that's why we get so many competitors from overseas running, almost every corner of the earth, almost every shirt. The athletes are wearing a telling a tale of fundraising in huge proportions. Even a guy there on his mobile telephone. Maybe keeping track of some of his friends in the race. And they'll still be pouring around Cuddy Sark for a good couple of hours yet, I'm sure. The restoration of this great, great landmark looks as though it's already started, but so much more money to be raised. Well, as Peter Elliott said, one pacemaker couldn't hang with this. And he's not a bad athlete himself. Can't even keep with Paula Radcliffe through 20 miles. She was just a little bit concerned about how close the uh, motorbikes were getting. We've all read about the collision that she had in Albuquerque, which uh, was the only threat to her preparation. She only missed one day's training when she had that fall. Bad fall, though it was, and uh, dislocated her jaw still bearing some of the scars from that. But, as I said, thankfully didn't interrupt her preparations too much. And we're seeing all of the evidence of that here today, flying along at the moment. And you can still see the scars on her knees. She scarred her shoulders and her hands, dislocated her jaw, grazed her face, and badly bruised and cut her knees. And she said that they're still, they're still a little bit painful, but at the end of the day, she's the one that came back from that. Her physiotherapist, Jared Hartman, didn't think she was going to able, be able to run today. He was very nervous when she had that accident a couple of weeks ago. But thanks to his help, she was, she's back there. And there's the men's race unfolding. The pacemakers doing a steady job there. And Paul Turgat, El Moaziz, Henrik Ramala from South Africa in that chasing group. Lee Bong Yu, the former Olympic silver medal. 
just in behind the leaders there. And the interesting thing there is the whole group really within splitting distance of the, of the leaders, just staying within sight, just staying connected, and the complete contrast. The men's race is a competitive one. The women's race would have been a competitive one, but Paula Radcliffe decided to ignore the rest of the competitors and run away from them. Just a word, Brendan, on the men's race and British athletes. It has been said that Paula Radcliffe will be the quickest British athlete here today, men or women, but uh, Carl Warren is uh, going pretty well. He's in 24th place at the moment, and uh, Carl Warren won the Reading Half Marathon recently, which incidentally is organised by Hugh Brescia, Chris Brescia's son. Hugh, of course, himself running today. And Carl Warren, I think, uh, taking exception to the fact that Paula might run faster than him. I don't think he knows how fast Paula's going, though. I think for about 2.15, and unfortunately, that's what she looks as though she might uh, complete the course in. So, But he's back in 24th place, not... Uh, uh, through 10 kilometres, wasn't too far behind uh, this lead group, actually. And Dave Mitchison was alongside him as well, so they are the two leading British athletes in the men's race. And, of course, Paula Radcliffe in the women's. So, approaching the one-hour mark, approaching... Well, not too far away from Tower Bridge, the halfway point as well, just beyond that. Still... All of the big names in there, El Mouaziz, Henrik Ramala just going through picture there, run a very quick half marathon just recently, he's in good form as well. And Paul Turgat still in that lead group as well, as are one or two of the other Kenyans, Raymond Kipkoic, who won Berlin last year, he's in that group, he wears number five, if you could spot him. And uh, as that group breaks up, we'll start to pick out more of the athletes. Great support here on Tower Bridge for these athletes. And often this point is where they just can't help themselves. Just start to gather pace, pick up on that little downhill section, the big crowds, the course starts to narrow a little bit. And often the pace starts to pick up as well. Meanwhile, in the women's race, this is interesting, isn't it? Dina Drossin. Now, Dina Drossin is uh, the American equivalent of Paula Radcliffe, and she's going well now, has moved through into third place. She said she was ready for a good one here. She just missed out on a gold medal at the World Cross Country Championships, finished second for the second year in a row just a couple of weeks ago. But, in fact, Brenda and I were talking to her coach as we see Dita going through the picture there. She started to fade away after that quick start. As at altitude, in much the same way as Paula Radcliffe, Dina Drossen, and uh, looking for something under 220 today. One more right turn, there he goes, and this is the winner of the men's wheelchair marathon, Joel Genoa of France, and it looks as though he hasn't made any errors whatsoever. This looks like a perfect race for, for Joel. Again, he's on target, he's, he's going to blitz the, the record for the race, I think. He's um, coming out of the shadow of the legendary Heinz Fry who's, um, again, been at the top of the sport for the last 10 years. He is now the top European. Last weekend in Paris, he beat uh, Heinz Fry by five minutes. He's now pushing awesome. That is a fantastic win for Joel Genoa. He's looking forward for the World Championships and the Europeans. He's a great winner. And the course record is absolutely shattered. It stood since 1998 by the great, the great Heinz Fry of Switzerland. And Joel Genoa has taken that record apart and beaten in the process, two former champions at the time uh, for being, being led there by Denis Lemunier. They're a full couple of minutes behind. And David Weir, champion last year in the All Black, is just behind him. But that was a phenomenal performance. To break away from so early and to stay out there, that's fantastic. That's what Joel is actually best at. He needs to get out there. He wants to drop the, the sprinters who are going to be around him because he doesn't have the best sprint finish in the world. Uh, but to get out there and push for what well, must have been about 15 miles on his own. Again, perfect conditions again. The wheelchair races actually like it to be a little bit warmer. Don't mind a little bit of breeze. Um, the cold temperatures are not, not what we're looking for. But he's pushing through there. He averaged about 17 miles an hour for that race. That's fantastic. Well, at the moment, David Weir just drafting in behind Denis Lemunier, champion two years ago. Weir, champion last year. I have to ask you, and who's your money on if this comes down to a sprint finish in the Mall? Well, David Weir, last year, just missed out.
in the the 200 meters and the 400 meters in uh, the world championships in Lille. So um, I think my money's on uh, David. I'll hold you to that. In a couple of minutes' time, they'll make uh, two right turns, one into the spur road before they hit the mall. And I was down at the, the Flora London Marathon exhibition the other day, having a chat with Sebastian Cohen, who asking, uh, asking him about any advice that he had for any of the runners out there who were watching us during the exhibition. He said, just make sure Buckingham Palace is on the left-hand side when you turn into the mall, otherwise you're going the wrong way. Well, no such mistakes for these two guys. One more big turn. The sweeping right-hand turn, and then they hit the mall, and then, really, it's heads down. And at the moment, David Weir just doing exactly the right thing, I guess. David's in the perfect position there. I think Dennis realises that, you know, he's going to have trouble with the sprint. David just mo moving up on the inside. I think he's going to try and stay with him as long as possible. The finish is quite hard here. Uh, you've got a bit of a crosswind, and it's ever so slightly uphill. David looks as though he's, again, he's moving across to try and make his break. I think Dennis has seen that he's lost it. Well, David Weir is going absolutely flat out, and as you say, Ian, it looks as though he's got the better of Denis Lemunier, but the Frenchman is not finished yet, but certainly two Frenchmen in the top three is an absolutely brilliant performance. Joel Genot smashes the course record to win, and in fact, David Weir is inside the course record as well, with Denis Lemunier breaking the record and finishing in third place. That is some day for the London Wheelchair Marathon. Three great performances there. Dave Weir as well. Again, part of the thing he's doing it here for charity as well. There's, the charity he belongs to Get Kids Going. I'm sure they're going to raise a lot of money with David as well. So again, not only is he in the elite race, he's also participating for a lot of other people as well and helping a lot of children with disabilities to get out there and push. Well, a great race then. A great race we're watching in the women's event. Five minutes and 11 seconds. The previous mile through 21 miles now, Paula Radcliffe as she heads towards the tower and is heading for a time which, well, I guess only Paula probably imagined. She's over one minute ahead of the time that she was running in Chicago last year when she ran a world record of two minutes, 17 and 17 minutes and 18 seconds. So she's heading for something inside 216 at the moment as she can keep this pace going completely on her own as she likes to be hurting now though the miles beginning to take their toll but getting great support from the crowd all the way and that will help really working for that though you can just tell there but just another interesting point there One hour, 43 minutes and 31 seconds 20 miles and we think that's a world best time for 20 miles so she's breaking world records on route this is a phenomenal piece of distance running and we're seeing an incredible performance too in second place from Catherine de Reba. she could actually be on her way to running with one of the fastest marathons of all time and she's in two minutes behind Paula Radcliffe Paula Radcliffe on schedule now to run under two hours 16 for the marathon which if she can keep going she should come home in that place and the men's race now stringing out they're running in the single file the pacemakers are doing their job the class athletes are staying in contention and that race now beginning to bubble and boil. Well, still a big group in the men's race. They're beyond halfway. And although the pace isn't as quick as Paula setting in the, or equivalently as quick in the men's race, they're still going well, they're still going well inside 2.7 pace, something in around 2.6, and a half. And plenty of big names there to push on. As we see there, the uh, two pace makers in one and two there, the two Kenyans, and then Wong Zhu Li, Ian Seister from South Africa, well up there, Paul Turgot, El Muaziz, Abera, Ngopolos, and Ramallah. The names there that you would expect to be figuring in the last few miles. Ibera, the Olympic and world champion who we had been hoping to see in London last year, he wasn't able to make it. Delighted he's here this time. Can he win a big city marathon? Says he likes to go for medals. This is a test for him to see how fast he can go with all of the other big names, with the pacemakers in. 4.54, the previous mile through to 13. 
little bit stretched out now compared to before. Pacemakers have done a good job, though. Elmo Aziz has always been very close. Paul Turgat just a little bit further back. Hendrik Ramala in that group as well. We're in the red, Nabera. Well, later on, we'll be giving you some uh, information about events you can see later on in the year on BBC. Great Manchester run coming up in May. And the uh, Flora Women's event in London. We'll be giving you details of those events in a few minutes' time if you want to get a pen and paper. If you uh, are inspired by what you're seeing here today and would like to get out on the road yourself. I'm talking about how quickly she's running here, Paula Radcliffe, uh, Brendan. I've got a feeling she must be running uh, pretty close to uh, the sort of pace that you once ran for the marathon. Isn't that amazing, eh? Hopefully Maybe a bit hope, quicker? Hope what's what's your best? Two hours, 15 minutes is my best. I only Eve. And I just wonder. There's Paula now, running fabulously well. The men are battling it out, but this one, she's battling it out herself. Four miles to go for Paula Radcliffe. She really is working hard now. She's gone through a couple of bad patches. She's had to work extensively just to keep it going. But you know what? With four miles to go, she's not going to give up on it. Now the back in the men's race. We'll watch Paula there and the back in the men's race. There they are. And you can see the group now. On the lead bike there, Richard Naruga, Britain's top, former top marathon runner. Richard, can you give us any indications from where you are? I think um, since halfway, the race has started to get interesting. El Mozzi's moved to the front, and you can see that he's now in third position, and he's urging the pacemakers to run a bit faster. So it's been quite conservative um, up till this point, but I think uh, over the next few miles, we're going to see the race breaking up. Thanks, Richard, and I think you're right. I think that is going to happen, and I think the pacemaker will do a bit more, and I think he's capable of doing a bit more. But look at the Korean on the shoulder of the leader, Lee Bong Yu former Olympic silver medalist coming back to form after a timeout through injury and the concentration on his face. El Mouazi is taking closer order and if you're in a race against El Mouazi is the Moroccan, you've always got to be aware of him because he sometimes starts to make his run for home an awful long way out. The strong man of the marathon, El Mouazi is the man with a fantastic record here in London. Number six there, just in third place in the red vest. He's been first and second, first and second and fourth two firsts, two seconds, and a fourth in London. He always comes here ready. He always comes here ready to run quick. He is so strong, and he will test them later on. And the second woman behind Paula Radcliffe, Catherine and Dereva, the second fastest woman of runner of all time, on the way to a fabulous run of Paula Radcliffe, clearly in record-breaking form today. And our question is, can Paula keep going? But the question for Catherine and Dereva, is can she run as fast as she's run before? The best time, two hours, 18 minutes and 47 seconds. And by my calculations, she's on schedule to beat her personal best. And she's been now just slipped in behind the two pacemakers. She's getting assistance as we watch Paula Radcliffe past the Tower Hotel on the cobbles. The crowd giving her tremendous support there. This is the hotel where the athletes have been staying all week. And Paula was telling me she loves the atmosphere here. This morning she got out of bed at five o'clock, went downstairs to breakfast and had, had a porridge and energy bar, she was telling me. Left there at 7.15 this morning, got to the start at eight o'clock. It's all regimented, it's all planned, it's all worked out. Ten minutes warming up, that's all, and stretching. And then the attention of the crowd, she said she really enjoys them, the crowd, the f people at the start and the fellow runners encourage her. She doesn't like it when they tell her they've got a bet on her. Well, Paula, we were too nervous to have a bet on you today, but we thought you could do it. As we look in third place now, Dina Drossen of the United States, running a terrific race, and she's on, also on schedule for a best time. She could go very close to two hours and 20 minutes. So Paula Radcliffe herself rewriting the record books, but bringing them on in her wake, and this the idea of having male pacemakers in this women's race, to give these women the opportunity of exploiting the best of their talent, then I don't think you can be Unless you're mean-spirited, I don't think you can begrudge these women the opportunity of running as fast as they can, being assisted by the pacemakers. If it's good enough for the men, it's got to be good enough for the women. Well, it will be interesting to see what comments Paula has at the end of this, because she's been helped, certainly, by the pacemakers. But I've got a feeling she would have run quickly anyway. And talking about uh, discarding with the pacemakers in the men's 
Al Moziz for the first time goes to the front. He likes to do this. He's won the race before by employing this tactic. Li Bongju just behind him. The other Kenyan, Kim Yi Yong in third place. Henrik Ramala is fourth. Paul Turgat behind him, fifth place. Ian Seister, sorry, in fourth place there. Ramala's a bit further back in the group. And, uh, well, El Moziz has just had a little laugh there, as if to say, well, I was just testing out, guys, only joking. Not ready to go yet. That's interesting, wasn't it? Just slotted back into the pack, looking around at everybody, having a bit of a chat. They're wondering what he's up to. There's uh, David McCory of Kenya wearing 15 drifts to the front. Won the uh, Paris Half Marathon earlier on this year, but really, you wouldn't think would have had the pedigree to beat two or three of the bigger names here. The Olympic champion still in the as well towards the back of Vera. So the, the big names all there. And El Moaziz. Well, he looks as though he wants to go, doesn't he? It was just a little, a little tentative bite at the apple there for him, and he just drifting across to the other side of the road maybe to get a drink there, but he certainly looks as though he's either waiting for somebody else to go or wondering whether he should do it himself. Paula Radcliffe there now. She's just run one, one hour, 53 minutes and 50 seconds. She's run the mile there with four miles to go in five minutes and six seconds, and that's the fastest mile that she's run in the race. 5.06 there for the 22nd mile, the fastest mile in the race, apart from one of the downhill ones early on. It's in fact the third mile, so Paula Radcliffe clearly is holding on now. She's clearly gone through a bad patch. We're watching Indoreba going through the Tower Hotel area, but Paula Radcliffe is clearly now on schedule to run sub uh, 2 hours 16 minutes. It'll be the first sub 2 hours 16 clogging for a woman. And let's face it, she's already got two records in the bag. She's got a 30K record and a 20-mile record in the bag. And now she's on her way. As we look at the second fastest marathon runner of all time, second in this race today, and possibly, possibly running the second fastest marathon of all time again today. So Catherine de Rebeck gauged this one properly. She clearly came here in great form. She said she was going to ignore Paula. She was going to ignore the pacemakers. She's getting some help from them now, but really, she's well on her way now. Paula Radcliffe about two and a half minutes ahead of Catherine and de Rebeck. So these two, maybe between them, are rewriting the record books. And the question is, can she hang on? Can she hang on at this pace? And the big question, can Paula beat her best time of 2 hours 17? She looks as though she's well on schedule to do it. As we look at Dina Drossen, the American champion, the queen of American distance running, second in the World Cross Country recently, and Dina Drossen comes through the Tower Hotel area, and Dina Drossen could be close to that 2 hours 20 clocking. So this could...